speak. And she was, uh, um, she was awesome. Like, and, and like a little, it was a little bit, uh, like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you're just like, oh, okay, we got a lot of, a lot of work to do. Yeah. She, she did a session for uh, WGBH. I, uh, oh yeah, that was it. <laughs> I, I have not yet listened to, but intend to listen to before tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Yeah. It was good. Yeah, and there's an excerpt of the book in the Washington Post as well. Yeah, it's a really important, yeah, thanks, Jim, for saying that it is a really important program. So um, if you haven't heard uh, that, um, he heard her speak before, it's really good. It's good even if you did, I hope to join too, if I can. Okay, yeah. see a lot of... He's <laughs> special just for educators, so... Yeah, I see a lot of hands in the air. So I'm going to go next. I don't know who put them up first, but we'll go to Katie and then Jim and then Gina. Thanks, Jen. Um, I have a couple most, um, the first being just around clean calls. We'll be off the next couple of weeks. We will not have a clean call again after this until early January. So just putting that out there. And then AGU, I just wanted to mention, we have the clean and ACE sort of um, co-sponsored workshop this year uh, happening on Wednesday, tomorrow um, in the middle of the day. And then um, we have similarly kind of clean slash ACE um, session, oral session, Thursday morning and poster session Thursday afternoon. If you're physically at AGU, there's, I think maybe going to be a informal get together tomorrow night. And if you're not um, physically there, I'm going to host a sort of informal virtual gathering that's actually going to be open to anyone who's attending or not attending AGU Thursday afternoon. I'll send another email about that too. So folks um, have that information again, just fresh of mind this week. But um, you can also check most of it out in the document that Gina put together that has different um, AGU climate literacy sessions. So that's kind of what's happening on clean side of things this week um, and then the next couple of weeks. So thanks. Oh, thanks so much, Katie, for um, and Gina for putting together that list. That is, um, that's awesome. Thank you, um, Jim. I, I guess you're next, and Gina, and then it looks like Frank Crenshaw has hit his hand up. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, so, adding to the really wonderful things happening at AGU um, this year, for the first time. Clean Network members will also be presenting at the largest AGU session of all, the entire AGU session, the largest one of all, and that is within education, and it is the Bright Stars. It's the program for students. Um, so very fittingly, students will be presenting on turning AGU science into climate action and how they're doing that as an example of turning climate action, science into climate action. They are inventorying among what they're doing is the federal buildings of Washington, D.C., their energy efficiency. They can go around and like behind me is the Capitol and looking where the lighting is efficient and where it is inefficient. The White House is pretty good. Department of Energy, we can see where it's good and where it's not good. The Department of Commerce, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Library of Congress, the Smithsonian's, and then they're communicating, or then they communicate with the federal government saying, look, you've got some lighting that's a real problem. This, you, don't, you might want to change that. You may not want to have your exhibit on climate change be lit with incandescent lighting. And we'll show you where you have incandescent lighting. We want you to change. So they're learning language arts, not just science. So that's pretty exciting that we're spreading that at AGU. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jen. Sorry. Thanks, Jim, so much. Uh, Gina, go ahead. Uh, yeah, also related to the clean calls, um, we are taking any suggestions anyone might have about uh, presenters they want to hear about next year, hear from next year. Um, we've got January and beginning of February all filled up, but after that, if you have any people that you work with that um, you know who would be good presenters or any projects that you um, think would be good to be highlighted on these calls, just email me. Um, I can put my email in the chat because we're, we're looking to fill up our, our schedule for next year. So just let me know if you have any suggestions about that. Thanks, Gina. Uh, Frank. Okay, a um, couple of things. First, first of all, I'm really grateful that there's gonna be some sort of informal gathering. I guess that's Thursday. 
um, at for AGU. Yeah, because I've had a double. A virtual, a virtual. Um, do you mean a virtual one, Frank? You're not there, are you? I don't think so. No, I'm not. I think that's your I'm office. Not. No, this is this is home. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would love to hear people's personal experience with the virtual platform because I know I've had a devil of a time with it. Um, it the other thing is more of a book, is more almost a book club thing than it is um, a, an announcement, but a couple of books I've bumped into recently that some of you may or may, or, may or not be familiar with, but I finally got around to getting a copy of Catherine Hayhoe's Saving Us, recommend it. And she actually makes a recommendation. So I went out and bought a, the recommended book, which is Christina Figueres on the future we choose. Both of those are really dynamite books. Great, thank you so much. I have one announcement um, tonight at six. Um, the Wild Center is doing an online Zoom program um, to hear from our delegates about the their experience at COP. Um, so it's just six to seven. It's a Zoom. Um, it's a Zoom event, and um, I hope that you can join. It's just you know um, just. You know, I don't know, pour yourself a glass of wine or a cocktail or the beverage of your choosing and, you know, grab a snack and, um, you know, it's like movie night or something. But anyway, so um, so please, please join if you can. It's tonight at six. Um, let's see. Any other announcements or things that folks want to bring up? Okay. And now I'm going to... Um, get it uh we're going to turn over into karen to speak about um her uh program on the oregon climate action hub um so i'm really looking forward to hearing about this and uh karen you're based in portland correct um yes and uh we're i'm just gonna turn it right over to you okie dokie awesome um thank you it's great to see all of you here today um I am new to the clean network, um, although I have a master's in education and um, have done informal education and substitute teaching. I have never um, been in the classroom um, or you know, properly really integrated into the, the national network of climate educators. So I'm, I'm really happy to be sort of um, here with you and also uh, aligned with the work that you're doing and hopefully um, presenting on a, a piece of the sort of the overall national puzzle um, that will be of interest to some, if not all of you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share a little presentation. All right, how does that look for everybody? Looks okay. great. Not yes. Great, great, yeah, awesome. Looks great. Fantastic. Um, so again, I'm, I'm here in Portland, Oregon, um, where it is currently very sunny um, and cold. And, um, and I've, I've lived here my whole life. I did uh, go back east for school. So I spent uh, four years in New Jersey and um, then promptly hightailed it back here. Um, I really strongly identify as an Oregonian. Um, and while I have lived the entire time I've been here at, um, in Portland and the city of Portland, that Oregonian identity is becoming like it's becoming really powerful for me um, over the last couple of years, especially. So um, part of our story with the Oregon Climate Action Hub is that we started doing um, doing this work as the Portland Climate Action Hub, PDX Climate or PDX Climate Hub. And um, and and again, part of our our origin story has us moving into the statewide work um, in a way that's really exciting to me. So, um, let's see. Boop. Um, the the exciting besides you know Oregonian identity, which probably isn't relevant for anybody except Frank Gr Granshaw on this call uh, right now, and Pamela and Coral, who are my collaborators with the uh, we sometimes call it Orca, the Oregon Climate Action Hub. Um, why is the Climate Hub relevant for climate educators? Well, because climate education and climate action are super close cousins. Um, and Clean Network is an amazing resource, as you all know, for climate education materials and for connecting between educators and people who are moving that, for, that work forward. Um, so what about climate action opportunities? Um, 
we've been working since January of this year on creating a one-stop shop in our state um, and also reaching out to collaborate with similar efforts across the country, um, mostly on the West Coast for now, um, but I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, our goal ultimately is to empower people who are developing their own growing awareness of the magnitude of the problem that we face with climate change uh, to do something, and not just to do something, but to do something effective where they are to, um, to combat or to, to engage in that issue. So just wanted to, again, say that, that close cousins, you know, once you start to learn about climate problems um, and the, the situation that we're in, um, it's a, a very natural transition, right, to want to take action. And from the Action for Climate Empowerment perspective, um, uh, the, 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 the resources about the actual scientific and, you know, political and social sides of climate um, are just as important to address from an action oriented like public education and public access um, perspective as from the classroom or you know young young person sort of knowledge building perspective. So that's where we sort of see ourselves in the work that we're doing. Uh, I mentioned that we're reaching out uh, to work with other similar efforts and we're doing that through something that I just gave a name to called the Climate Hubs okay. Collaborative. Uh, Nancy Gigi, who's on this call too, likes to call it uh, HubNet. And I think that's probably a better name for it, but uh, here I have it. You know, we have several efforts um, across the country that are pursuing something similar to what we're doing. And um, not, not quite at the beginning of the Climate Hub effort, but pretty close to the beginning. I started thinking, gosh, you know, this is, maybe something that's going to be useful for Oregon. I think it is. Um, what if, you know, we're, we're pursuing this in concert with other organizations in other places um, and, you know, learning from each other, best practices, um, what hurdles we're hurdling, how we're hurdling them, and how we can help each other build up the the quality of the resources that we're offering, as well as kind of the national movement toward climate action and climate education. So um, we're doing that. We meet every month um, at a really inconvenient time, 3.30 p.m. on Fridays, but it just happened to be the thing that worked. So it's on the calendar. Um, and, uh, and everybody here or anybody that you know um, is, is welcome to attend that as well. Although it's a little bit sort of practitioner oriented on the hub side. Um, so for the, the Oregon Climate Action Hub, um, this is a, a core team meeting photo that we took uh, the other day. We're all um, oriented toward Oregon, but not all of us are in Oregon. And we've only met virtually. I just think that's interesting. You know, in this last couple of years, I don't know if any of you have that same experience of primarily knowing collaborators through the box, but um, we, you know, we have uh, folks on our team that are across the country and around the world. Um, and I'll, I think I saw, so definitely saw Coral. Coral Avery um, is here in Portland and is a, has been a core team member since the beginning. Um, Pamela Edwards is also here and she's in New Zealand, but her heart is in Portland and we'll, she'll be coming back here um, after her stay in New Zealand uh, in a couple of months. So we'll get to meet in person, yay. Um, and then Diana Jones is also in Portland. She's the bottom left. And David Haken is in Kansas City, Missouri. And then we have a, a sort of a newer arrival to the team, Sam Butler, who's based in Croatia at this time. And we have a wide range of, of motivators, you know, things that brought us to collaborate with each other on this work. But primarily, we all want to take effective climate action, and we know others do too. So we see people... Um, coming up against the information, um, and and at least in in our place, and I don't think this is too dissimilar from other places, um, finding it difficult to figure out exactly how to plug in with their particular resources and their particular um, orientation, you know, in the world. Um, okay, like where do I go? Uh, is it three hundred and fifty? Is it Citizens Climate Lobby? Is it you know 
Extinction Rebellion, what, where, where do I go? And there's no kind of one place that you can go to figure out where to go. Um, you have to start poking around and, you know, that relationship building and um, uh, time investment can be a, a bit of a barrier uh, for a lot of people. Um, so we don't want that to um, dissuade people from taking action. And we also um, recognize that there are a lot of, of sort of personal platforms for taking action. Uh, Bright Action is one that we've um, engaged with quite a bit and it's great. Um, and it's not alone, Earth Hero, uh, Act Now from the UN. Um, but we want, again, to not just have people thinking about their own, um, like their own personal sphere, but to connect what they're doing personally uh, with larger community efforts and, um, and you know, what's, what's actually happening in their community that they might be able to plug in with and find community and find, um, find something that has longevity uh, and can kind of scale. Um, so, you know, we also, we see this from um, the perspective of organizations as well, because there are a lot of organizations that are providing pathways for people to engage, um, whether it's at that personal household level or on a bigger scale. Um, but uh, the, you know, organizations still are, um, you know, are all doing their own work and uh, not necessarily, although there are some powerful coalitions in Oregon, um, not necessarily communicating or coordinating around some of that work. So we're, we're hoping that aside from providing a user experience that's really um, helpful for folks to get engaged, we're also providing a benefit to organizations um, to help align their work with each other and make it more powerful in doing so. So I'm, I'm not gonna dive into this too much. I, I know you all will get, you know, you'll have access to this uh, afterwards, but our mission is con to connect all Oregonians with opportunities to take effective climate action. And we don't properly define what effective climate action is. We want to have a, a big tent of sorts where a lot of different types of action fit. Um, but we do ask folks before they post an opportunity to consider these, um, these questions. Um, so consider how their project um, really fits into that bigger whole. Um, and we could loop back to this if you all want, but I also kind of want to show the tool off. So I want to zoop to that. Um, our goal is to offer a, a calendar of upcoming climate action opportunities, um, a map, uh, resource pages, because we, we aren't providing a lot of information. Um, we are leaving it up to organizations that are providing action opportunities to then be, you know, click throughable to whatever information is relevant on that subject. Um, and we've also found that people tend to get overwhelmed um, diving into a lot of information. And, and again, there's lots of great resources for, for doing that and we're facilitating the action component. So we'll have a little bit of resource information, um, but it won't be particularly comprehensive. Um, we'll, we'll rely on the network to provide that um, that depth and um, organizational profiles. So organizations that are doing the work will have kind of a little um, place to go um, once they fill out a uh, essentially an application. It's like a, a regular user profile, but then they get uh, posting privileges as organizations. Um, then they'll show up as vetted organizations within that um, that sort. And then the opportunities themselves, um, which have, you know, there are, there are many, many, many types of opportunities um, from vo volunteer roles to jobs, to, you know, calling legislators, to uh, joining working groups, to presentations, to, you know, demonstrations. Um, there are many, <laughs> many, many. Um, we don't have them listed quite yet. So I'll get to that in a second, but um, I wanted to list this, not because I expect everybody here to recognize all of these um, organizations, but just to give a sense of 
um, who we have reached out to before even putting together the hub itself, like the actual technology of the hub. And um, we wanted to have conversations conceptually um, to essentially figure out if we were heading in the right direction. Um, so we did, and we had a lot of uh, informal conversations and then uh, did a, a very structured round of what we called you, me, we conversations with um, specifically organizations representing climate justice um, perspectives in the state. And that was awesome. That is how we ended up going from PDX Climate Hub to Oregon Climate Action Hub. Um, we were getting the feedback that, you know, we have great climate organizations across the state um, and great willingness and, you know, passion to get involved. But um, the majority of the sort of the, the, hmm the epicenter uh, for resources, you know, for, for capacity in the state is Portland. Um, so yeah, we're, we're based here, but we're definitely um, wanting to, uh, to be connected across the state and to provide a place that um, supports the, the work of organizations across the state, which may not have capacity to have their own hub down the line, which is one model that we considered. So um, we have a, a list of 400 organizations in the state of Oregon that have some connection to climate work, whether that's you know, businesses that signed the We Are Still In pledge or participation in signing on to any of the coalition uh, legislative work that has been done over the last several years. Um, it's a very, very big list. Um, and so, not, again, not all of those organizations have climate as their primary work, but um, it's kind of a, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big list. There are a lot of uh, potential uh, opportunity um, providing organizations out there. So I, I mentioned climate justice and the fact that it's been sort of a central concern for our core team since the beginning. Um, our core team demographics are, you know, better than they were at the very, very beginning of the effort when um, a, a citizens climate lobby mutual colleague uh, connected me and the Pachamama Alliance folks. So Diana and Pamela come from Pachamama Alliance leadership in the city. Um, and, you know, we, we started talking about this idea, um, but we haven't grown the core team in the way that we were expecting or hoping to do. Um, and we've had some, you know, some conversations with allied organizations and that you, me, we round of conversations that I mentioned. Um, we've engaged with a racial equity tool um, and the, the most exciting development along those lines is that we are having a conversation with an organization that is an umbrella for climate justice, uh, frontline serving organizations in the state uh, about potentially becoming a, a project of that organization. So that's called the Oregon Just Transition Alliance. And this is, you know, I, I think um, directly putting this tool in the service of the organizations pursuing climate justice as their primary aim um, is the best way to ensure that it in fact serves the purposes of climate justice within our state. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm sitting here crossing my fingers a lot for that um, to become a reality over the next several months. Um, and the, the tool itself, you know, as well as the thinking behind it has evolved over the last year um, from a placeholder page to that, the PDX Climate Hub, to um, a, a community calendar during COP26. Um, Frank Granshaw made an awesome list of events happening around COP26. And we had been requested by a couple of community organizations to put up a calendar. So we did that during, um, during COP26 as well. Um, local Portland events happening during that period of time. Um, and then have, have just launched it's still uh it's still um in progress um so we we haven't formally launched the Oregon Climate Action Hub but it is at its home URL as of two days ago 
So we're not, um, we don't have any sort of plans to go public with it yet. Um, we're still testing and uh, refining some, some of the pieces that, um, you know, we expect to be done before we launch it. Um, but our, it is there, it's at home. And um, our next stage is to pilot it with a couple of um, specifically chosen organizations off that list of 400 um, that we think will help us um, continue to, you know, ensure that the, the technology represents the best uh, thinking that we've put into the development um, to this point. So this is, um, this is what it looks like. This is like the landing page, the front page. And um, I'm going to show you that live in one moment. Um, so I'm just gonna do two more slides, talk about open loops really quickly. Um, mentioned that we don't currently have an organizational home. We've been doing this just as volunteers. Um, I've had the capacity to do it because um, I have a salaried position that's been moving at a very slow pace over the last year during some administrative transitions. Um, so that's given me, you know, quite a bit of volunteer capacity. Um, uh, but we we do believe that the the climate the climate action hub needs a, a place to live. Um, I hope it's OJTA, but if it's not, then we need to find that um, for um, essentially longevity purposes. A lot of the feedback that we got, besides the "Hey, you should be statewide." Uh, during our you me we conversations was we don't know that we can trust you you know if you're just another volunteer organization that kind of comes up ephemerally and you know provides a thing but doesn't have any staff or other sort of like funding infrastructure eh we'll wait like we'll wait to get involved until we see that you're really here to stay and that this is something that we can invest in and trust over the long the long run so we need to be able to show people that yeah we're here to stay we need to staff the resource, um, probably one FTE, but that's not, you know, a done deal. Um, we need to pay that person well because the um, the type of thought work and the leadership that's required for the, the stewardship of a resource like this is, you know, is significant um, and ought not to be trusted to um, interns, for example, because um, it's, you know, it is that important. Um, interns are great. Nothing wrong with interns, but we need that permanency, that stability um, that can offer you know, trust and, and longevity to organizational partners and to users as well. Um, and you know those technical issues that I mentioned, um, for instance, we uh, that or the organizations page where you can see all the organizations that are active in this space that have uh, signed on as users for the hub and have posted opportunities. Um, we haven't exactly figured out where to put that yet. Um, and so that doesn't exist yet. Um, and we're using a proprietary software that was uh, essentially donated to us for this purpose. But um, if we want to make good on that sort of connectivity dream of having this type of resource be able to function elsewhere outside of Oregon, then an open source um, approach would probably be a better approach. So that's a big question. How do we get from where we are now uh, to an open source tool? Um, we have a lot of questions that keep arising with regard to governance. So um, who is at the table when we're figuring out how to vet organizations for posting um, privileges or how um, we're going to vet, you know, if we get down to the level of vetting individual opportunities for action? Who's there? Who's, who's making those decisions? Um, how are we engaging users? Is there an opportunity for a, a user's council or some other type of uh, engaging governance um, with the, the end user of this tool? Um, and how are we collecting data? Who gets the, you know, who gets the email list um, of all of the people that are participating? That's pretty, pretty precious stuff. So uh, people have asked us what happens when there are disagreements between uh, different organizations approaching, you know, the same issue from different perspectives. Do they both just get to put an opportunity on the site? Um, or, you know, is there any kind of a, 
like alignment process that we might be able to offer eventually. Um, what about, you know, having, having resources available for both nonprofit organizations and political action organizations? Um, they often pursue things in different ways. And obviously the, org the umbrella organization for this project would need to be appropriately um, registered so that it could handle both of those types of, of action and not go afoul of the IRS, et cetera. Uh, we will need to be outreaching and, and essentially marketing this tool on a regular basis and developing a social strategy around that. We have um, done, we, we have no social media presence at all at this point. Um, and so, you know, that's a, a whole development curve in and of itself. Um, talked about staffing already. And then of course, funding. Um, funding will be a key, you know, decision-making factor to, to how we can develop the social media strategy, for example, and how we get the marketing done and, and who we're reaching out to and the longevity of this, um, this resource as well. And even that sort of software development side of things going from the proprietary software to an open source tool, which we really would like to do and have, have wanted to do since the beginning. So funding. Okay. And I did, I said I was going to give you a quick tour through the, um, through the, the resource if folks want to see that. Um, but these were a couple of questions that I had that I wanted to bring to this group. Um, are you aware of anything else like this where you are um, or anywhere else in the world? Um, how do you imagine something like this might support your work? And I, I put a, a frame in there um, for the, the user story, which is something we've been encouraged to invest in, um, identifying who our audiences are and specifically what is motivating them to engage and like what they want to get out of it, you know, what their end result is that they want to get out of that engagement. Um, so I just think that's a neat way to, you know, to talk about it. As a mom, I want to be able to put my kids in front of this so that I can, you know, trust that they have access to climate action opportunities um, that are well vetted and that, you know, if they, if they want to go forward on any of them, um, then I'll be able to support them in that, um, for example. So I, I just, I like that frame a lot. Um, how else can we be engaging with diverse stakeholders as we go forward? And then how will we define and measure success? Um, and anything else that anybody would like to talk about either before or after we look at the Climate Action Hub live. I know there's a lot in the chat, but I haven't been reading along with that. Maybe I'll check in with chat really quick. And if anybody wants to pop in with verbal comments. Yeah, I'll just I'll just note that um, I am. It's like at least once a month, I learn about some new organization or some organization that I hadn't heard about in upstate New York that's working on climate change. And I think uh, it was maybe January of 2020, Jen and I talked about <laughs> coordinating some of that. And that was January of 2020 and things kind of fell yeah. off the radar for, for uh, coordinating across the state. But I think there's a real need, uh, you know, it's a fractal need sort of at just about every scale. There's uh, multiple organizations with uh, some overlapping uh, goals that if we could figure out how to get them talking things would be better. <laughs> and of course, you know, Jen and I talk, <laughs> and I talk with, with people at, at many of those other organizations, but we don't generally get together in the same space, either virtual or actual, very much. So I applaud your efforts and may try and copy them to some degree. Yeah, I think there's going to be, I totally agree with everything Don just said. And I think... <laughs> <laughs> There's just a real need for it. I'm sorry, Frank Meeple's not on the call right now, but maybe you've um, spoken with him in the past, Karen, because um, he, you know, we're just looking for models similar to this where, you know, there's some iteration opportunities to figure out how we operate at a state level and like how that can then inform, you know, 
or not federal strategy, depending on who's in office, you know, but like the need at the state level is so great. And so this is amazing. And I see there's other hands up. Sorry, I jumped in Frank and then uh, Katie, and then we'll go. I want to make sure we have time to go check out your site too. Go ahead, Frank. Okay. So Karen, yeah, we definitely have to talk uh, since we're in the same corner of the universe. Uh, but I do have a question for you. Uh, in the list of Oregon groups that you've connected with, have you connected with, with uh, Citizens Climate? Yeah, because I'm particularly, uh, the, 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 there's two things that sort of come to mind with that. First of all, the Southwest chapter has a uh, climate cafe that they do regularly. Uh, Roshenda does that down there. And then there's also the fact that the uh, last cop, um, the all throughout Scotland, uh, citizens, uh, uh, let's try this again. Uh, cli climate reality was working with the Scottish government to establish all these climate cafes all over the place in Scotland. And there's some stuff there that I think is really symbiotic with some of the stuff you're talking about that would be great. Uh, to chat more about. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, we, we have talked with CCL, um, but um, they they haven't, um, I think they're one of the organizations is kind of waiting to see um, what it might turn into. Um, the In Scotland, there was an RFP or an RFI for research on climate hubs, um, which is one thing that I've, I've just found. I didn't find the, the ultimate result of that. I just found like a two-year-old RFI. Um, so that's a really cool connection that I'd love to talk more about. And also um, climate reality has led a, a, you know, a climate hubs effort in Canada that is pretty impressive. Um, so there are some models uh, outside of the US for you know, how to create local hubs that then have a, a national network holding them, you know, holding them together, providing resources, et cetera. We um, definitely need to talk. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Hey, Katie. Um, Thanks, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I have also lots of that. I totally agree with Don and Jen in terms of like, this is a really cool thing and I'm really glad you're working on it. Um, and I love this sort of, you know, anyways, I think that, you know, Clean has some, especially um, the person who has been on Clean the longest, Anna, who is um, my, the director of my group at Serious Education Outreach now too, um, and Frank and Tamara would be great people to connect with around like, you know, how Clean was put together and how it's been sustained and sort of grown over time, because that's, I think, always the problem with trying to put it like, resource centers together is like how, like you were saying, funding is always such an issue and like, how do you sustain these things? And, you know, so I think we can definitely keep talking and, and be a resource. And one thought I had around that was sort of like, you know, how do you like define and measure success? A lot of, a lot of what we do is sort of measuring web analytics and things like that, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that just thinking about some of those things, um, it'd be great to talk at some point. But my question for you is actually kind of along what Jen and Dom were talking about. It's like, I love this idea and like definitely state level. I think Jen's right. Like this needs to happen at state levels. And I'm just curious, I know this is probably beyond what you're thinking of right now since you're just starting to kind of, you know, put this out there and, and work on it and things like that. But um, I, so maybe it's not a question, maybe it's just an encourage you to think about, um, and I'm sure you might have already, but just the thing that I'm thinking about is like, oh, how can this be replicated? How can this be sustained for like other areas too? Like this is be something that would be so cool to have a larger level. I agree that has to be like probably more at a state level for each hub or whatever, but like having this for you know, the Northeast or the Northwest or different states or whatever it is, like just, yeah, thinking about making, trying to make sure it's like replicable. I think it's something that's gonna be important to think about as you guys move forward too. Yeah, because so much of the um, replicability or so much of the success that I believe that we will have um, is because of relationship building and because of, um, 
you know, because of sort of assessing the, the, the territory before creating the tool. We had a pretty good idea, you know, before we went forward with the tool because we had a model already. The person who donated the, the back end of the site um, had already created, he custom built it to create his own platform, shareoregon.com. Um, just as a, a personal passion project um, to share really cool things happening across the state, you know, ways that people could engage um, with fun stuff. And, um, and so he donated it. And um, therefore, we had, you know, his site as a model for what we could probably do. Um, but it has grown and evolved in significantly, you know, in those conversations with other, you know, organizations. And so something that works here may or may not work elsewhere because of that relationship infrastructure and because of the needs um, that exist. So I think it's, it does much about like, how do you do a similar kind of investigative process, you know, ahead of dropping a tool into whatever other environment might seem like it needs it. Um, so I, I do see um, the question in the chat too about creating spaces for students and young people. And um, that's, fantastic question um so hmm. uh hmm. the the so our, our core team right now is mostly um you know we have a, a pretty good generational spread um coral who's um, i think still here um is our youngest member and is has been involved in climate justice for many years at this point through undergraduate and into her work um currently as well um so we have been able to do a, a little bit of diversification like i said of our, our core team demographics but and so we're you know coral's very very tapped in to um especially in the native community, what, um, what young people are up to, um, which is amazing. So we're getting sort of that fed in directly, but there's the, the Sunrise Movement was one of the first organizations that I reached out to and I, you know, reached out to them a couple of times directly um, and they didn't have capacity to engage in the process at that time. But again, Coral already has those, those existing um, relationships and so once we're to a point where we're which is coming very very soon um where we can offer like a particular way of engaging not just like hey we think we're making a tool you want to like talk about it but you know hey we've got the tool this is what a pilot participation looks like you know are you are you interested now like what you know how does this seem for you those ongoing relationships are the most important um thing that we could you know we can engage in and continue to um, continue to sort of bring in, I think. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's see. So um, people are saying they want to see the site. I'm going to go ahead and, oh, I think stop and reshare other window. Boop, boop. All right. So um, everybody see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it looks a lot like what I just showed you as a screenshot because that was a recent screenshot. Um, but what the, the things that we are sort of still puzzling through, like I mentioned, are the organizational page um, where what we think it's going to be is there's going to be in-person and online events. And then there's just going to be one other post type, which is like a, a profile or organization. And so when you select Right now, we don't have any in-person events. They're just we just haven't filled out the uh, the opportunities yet. But if you look for online events, hey, look at that! We have all these things that you can do online. And if you were to, uh, were to choose that third option, you would just see organizations. So instead of seeing all of these things that are posted by the Oregon Climate Action Hub, you would see things that are posted by Sunrise or XR or 350 or CCL or climate reality or, you know, whoever else there's, um, so you would see their little um, profile picture and then you'd be able to click through like you can for the Oregon Climate Action Hub, read a little description and uh, see what all they have posted currently as opportunities for engagement. Um, oh, back to here. So on the front page, 
we've been going back and forth about how how we tag and that's a really important thing for the user experience um but what we are just going to do our pilot with is categories so what type of um opportunity is this um and then solution sector and area so this is uh, a list of drawdowns primarily drawdowns sectors um and you can search just for the things that you're interested in if you're interested in say you know food agriculture and land use spoiler alert you're not going to find anything because i don't have anything in that category right now oh oh right because these ones actually it's um these ones are all sectors so just kidding there you go um you've got a couple of options in that uh, in that sector um so that's the post view that'll show you like everything events have a time um time delimited aspect to them and oh there used to be one that i could show you but it actually passed it was last night so uh, this will show up as a list of um of upcoming opportunities um and it'll be in chronological order it'll look it won't look like a calendar but it will look um it'll have date and time for each of those um each of those events darn it it looks a lot better when they had actual population there well this is the map um so obviously across oregon um when you click into whatever location you're interested in uh you can go directly to that post oh my gosh we're there we can go back um anything that's oregon wide is going to land right here in the middle of oregon it's very cute so all of these statewide resources will be here. Um, obviously, when you're in Portland, you might want to get a little bit closer to see if there are, um, you know, things happening in your neighborhood, particularly. But for now, we just have. Oh, this is the one that passed yesterday. Cute that it's still there. Um, so we're doing charter reform right now, and uh, there are folks that are wanting to have. Uh, a bit more climate focus on that process. You know, how do we have a government for the next 10 years that actually can function in a more climate um, aware way? Um, so anyway, back and back and back at the beginning, um, you will also be able, again, this isn't super powerful right now, but like uh, if you wanted to search for anything that was, you know, that you could have in your classroom, for example, um, then you could maybe use that as a keyword. Um, let's see, let me see if it pulls up my charter reform. Yeah, it'll put it up, pull it up on the map. Interesting. This is one of those tech things. Why does it show up on the map still and not on the event list? Question mark. But um, you can see there are many ways to engage with um, the different, you know, different opportunities. And it's going to be so much better just over the next couple of weeks when we're doing our initial pilot. And I'm actually inviting organizations to sign up and to put their own opportunities on here. Um, this is going to be, you know, pages long instead of just five events. And um, it's, you know, going to be start to sort of get into the mode of being a powerful resource instead of like, oh, that still seems like it's going to be cool. But We'll see how it goes. So let's see. Um, um, there's there's one really good comment in the chat about uh, showcasing some, you know, showcasing uh, elementary and high school conversations. Um, and I think that that aspect of solutions storytelling is something that Emily Corin and I have been talking about kind of from the beginning as well. And this, this is very much front loading the opportunities to take action um, and not necessarily focused on the, hey, we took action and like, you know, check it out. Um, so I, we've, we've talked about a couple of different ways of um, like mapping or otherwise sharing out the results of all this action taking that hopefully will be happening um but that is uh not yet a um a strength of the platform um so yeah any ideas that you might have on how to 
um, how to integrate solution storytelling would be appreciated. Um, and then will past events be archived with links um, like videos and other resources? Um, so there is a um, like an expiration date to um, to opportunities where um, you could set that expiration date for after the event itself and say you were the organization that was posting that opportunity, you could go back in and you could edit that opportunity after the, the date and you could put the video link um, if your organization had recorded it and wanted to make that available. You could also just post a new opportunity that says, check out this video of this event that we did. And that would be the action opportunity. However, I think the, um, again, st steering away from info overload, um, there are a lot of places on the internet where you can go watch really amazing presentations that happened once, you know, about whatever climate topic you're interested in. Um, and, uh, and I think it, it might clog up the works if we tried to um, be a, like a showcase for that past stuff. It's, it's, it's kind of a forward thinking resource in that way. Um, but that's not to say you couldn't do it. Um, and, and I think there is a lot of trust also through this tool in the organizations that are uh, posting the opportunities um, to, to have their own sort of management system. Cause there's not gonna be like through the hub, you will click through to that organization that's managing their signups, managing their, um, you know, the correspondence around that uh, event, for example. Um, but you're not going to register via the Climate Hub. Um, it is a it is a pass through resource, and there's quite a bit of expectation that the organizations will continue to manage their own processes, including that follow up um, posting resources afterward and things like that. So, but that is another thing that, along with the solution storytelling, how do you? you know, how do you be accountable? Like you're direct, directing all these people to go do these actions. Well, what happens next? What did they do them? Uh, how did it go? Um, and et cetera. So um, that's, these are really, really good questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing for now. That wasn't probably the most organized uh, tour of the site ever, but since it's up now, you could go look for yourself at orclimatehub.org. I will put that in the chat. Um, but you know, don't direct anybody to it that's not on this call quite yet, because uh, we have a couple more improvements to make before it goes um, really public. There you go. <sighs> Awesome. That is so cool. I have like 8 million questions, I think probably are just like, you know, my idea, um, uh, idea wheels are spinning in my brain and Don and I are already scheming to start talking about this in New York state again, because we did start talking about it pre pandemic and then the world right before the pandemic, right Don, And then the world, you know, Yes, we, did. Um, we have a Google Doc that was last. We have a Google Doc. Um, 28th, 2020. <laughs> yeah. Um, does anybody, we have a couple of minutes left. Does anyone have some additional sort of questions or comments? I mean, honestly, like this is the sort of thing where like a big infusion of funds you could see would elevate the, I mean, you're already doing amazing work, but like it would obviously like having the dedicated time and resources and abilities. And one thing I found that was kind of interesting I, when you first started talking, I was not, I was like, okay, action hub. Like I was wondering if it was education oriented, but it seems like you're really going across all sectors from what I can see and from your presentation, right? Is that correct? It's really across the, across the gamut. Definitely across the across the board. Um, I can see this being a really powerful tool in the classroom um, because you know the teachers that I've worked with who um, do climate education, uh, you know, hit that point. Sometimes it's like the first moment of the class 
you know, where I already know, I, I already know whatever you're going to teach me about like how crazy things are getting. Like, I already know it's bad. And I already have like this much anxiety about it. You're just going to push me over the edge. Right. Um, unless there's something that you're telling me I can actually do to, to, to make it better, to make a difference. Um, and so there's, you know, there's not just that resistance in the classroom to getting more information. There's like resistance out there in the community. I can talk to my mom about it and she'll be like, uh, yeah, but mm, give me something I can actually do. And then maybe we can continue this conversation. Right. Um, so, so having this as a, an adjunct to the educational piece, to the like information engagement, um, I think will be, uh, really important. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not just limited to educational events, for sure. Yeah, and if you had, I mean, I think you sort of talked a little bit about this, but have you had um, conflict around like this? Or it seems like you're really sort of positioning it as a as a backbone organization, or like as a backbone for all these other for this like large collaborative or or coalition. But have you have you felt like other organizations get kind of like weird about like, oh my God, like we're doing this already or like actually climate reality has a big presence in New York State. They've got all kinds of like action hubs happening. But I to me it's like it's maybe broader than what they're doing. But um I'm just curious like where that has come up because I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. Yeah. Is that is the we're all competing for the territoriality and we're yeah. all competing for the same funds and it just you know it's like this endless cycle of that yeah the, um that's definitely not an you know outside of my sphere of awareness it definitely is, is existing here as well but um i think the the key is we're not we're not demanding you know affiliation from anybody that participates it's just like this is a place to reach more users um, and it is an opportunity to sort of be there with everybody else. Um, you don't have to be working necessarily with everybody else in any particular way. We're not like, we're not demanding anything. Just show up and put your stuff here. And if connections happen and if you have some visibility into somebody else's event and like choose to get in touch with them, that's gonna be easy to do through the hub, um, like user to user uh, contact. Um, uh, but, uh, there's, I think that's the idea of the, the big tent. And, um, we have tried to be sort of non-challenging and non-prescriptive, um, to whatever people might be doing. Um, but yeah, it does involve some, so like rising above the fray or something like that. That is, is, it is a strategy, you know, it's a strategic position. Awesome. Thank you. I know we're right at the hour. So I, I did see Frank had his hand up by um, thanks everybody for coming. If you need to hop off, go ahead. If we have another minute, Frank, I think Karen, do you have a, a moment to stand? Frank, if you had a question. Yeah, I just have a, a quick thing to throw in uh, something else to chew on rather than just thinking about students as content consumers on the hub. You might want to think about them as content creators. I'm thinking about uh, capstones at university studies at Portland State, all sorts of things like that. And that's another thing I want to talk to you about. That's awesome. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Looking Sounds like you're going to get a bunch of uh, follow up calls after this, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm open to it. I'll put my, I, I think um, my contact information is probably going to be in the posted information about this, like as we follow up. but. Um, that is my best email address, and um, I will even put, uh, this is a Google Voice number, so don't be alarmed when it asks you, if you call me, uh, to identify yourself, but you know what, then we'll get in touch, so. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. So, Katie, this is, and Gina, this is the last call before the holidays, right? Again, just for those that right. popped on late, so I'm yep, wishing, yep. just wanted to wish everyone a healthy and safe and happy holiday season where everyone stays well and healthy in this crazy world um and happy new year and well happy looking forward to 2022 go 2022 <laughs> so we'll be really excited about 2022 um so be well everybody take good care karen thanks again for being and presenting being here and presenting today thank you all I'm looking forward to staying in touch
Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.